Okay, it's good to be back. Thank you for praying for me as I travel to the U.S. I got home Friday night about 10 p.m. And uh, praise the Lord, I slept well Friday night. I slept well Saturday night. So uh, uh, you probably heard the saying, east is a beast and west is best. Uh, so I had bad jet lag going the other direction, but uh, it doesn't seem to be quite so bad coming this direction. Uh, but thank you for praying. My mom is uh, physically right now. She's doing very well. She's able to live independently at home. Uh, we're still waiting for the oncologist appointment that's supposed to take place later this month. Uh, she's going to have a CAT scan, and then um, the oncologist is going to give some recommendations for treatment. Uh, she's 87. She really doesn't want to go through chemo, so I uh, just appreciate your prayers for her, for her health, and then also for my brother and I as we try to help her uh, make important decisions about her treatment. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews tonight, chapter 11, and tonight we'll be looking at verses 23 through 31. And in past weeks, we've examined the examples of faith before the flood. Uh, We've seen the examples of faith of the patriarchs, and tonight we'll be looking at the examples of faith during the time of Moses and the exodus from Egypt. Uh, I want you to notice as we read through these verses, the focus in these examples is on the choices and actions of these people uh, based on their faith during a time of great moral crisis. Uh, So I want you to pay attention, think of their choices and actions based on faith. So let's read this text. You follow along as I read verse 23 through 31. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these um, uh, Old Testament examples of people who uh, exercised faith in a time of uh, uh, moral crisis and uh, great testing, and yet because of their faith, uh, we see that they accomplished great things for you, that you accomplished great things by means of their faith, and so we pray that you'd help us as uh, we consider these examples, help us to be imitators Uh, of their faith, uh, that you would use us in our own day uh, to bring glory to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Many of you have probably read uh, the well-known book, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, which is an historical record written by Englishman John Fox in 1563. And it's amazing that a book that was written so long ago is still as popular as it is today. Uh, It's a record of Christians who suffered death for the name of Christ from the time of the early church on through uh, the Middle Ages and to his own time. Uh, Under the Roman emperors and later under the popes of the Roman Catholic Church, many Christians were put to death for their faith. And John Fox left a record, an historical uh, document that describes uh, the experience that many of these people went through for the sake of Christ. Now, there's another historical record of suffering for faith that's found, actually found in the Apocrypha. Uh, it's the book of uh, First through Fourth Maccabees. I don't know if you've heard of those. Uh, I don't recommend the Apocrypha, uh, but the books of Maccabees are actually a good historical record of the suffering of Jewish believers in the second century B.C., under the wicked rulers of Syria who came down and invaded Israel and abolished the the keeping of the Jewish law for a period of time. They desecrated the temple. 
And the books of Maccabees are a record of a, a group of people, a family, the Maccabean family that uh, rose up and resisted these, uh, these enemies of the faith. Uh, many of them died for their faith. And in these books, there are records of some of the people that died because of their faith in God. Uh, these people all lived in times of great moral crisis and personal testing. And in it, they demonstrated faith and courage, which is an example for us today. And in the same uh, uh, fashion, we can see here how the author has turned to the Old Testament scriptures to find examples of faith and endurance for us to imitate today. And that's what we're looking at as we look in these examples. Uh, tonight, we're looking particularly at the examples that come from the period around the exodus from Egypt and the uh, conquering of Canaan. Romans 15.4 says this, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. The thing we need to realize is that like all of these people, these Old Testament examples or the Christians in the early church or even the Jews uh, uh, in the Old Testament period that suffered, that just like them today, we are also living in a time of great moral crisis. Uh, it's not hard for us to look around us at the, uh, the things, the global events that are taking place around us. And to recognize that every believer today is in a situation in which we must continually choose and act rightly. And the only thing that will inform our choices and our actions is to have a genuine faith in God. Now, we've been describing faith. We've been trying to uh, define it, to explain what it is, how it operates uh, we need to, again, just reiterate, faith is not simply a wishful hope that we make true by believing it. No, true biblical faith is always based on the word and promise of God. Uh, the word of God is the foundation on which faith is built. And so faith is the response to God's word by acknowledging and recognizing that he is truthful and faithful. And so as we reckon God faithful, this faith will enable us to respond to the crises of life in a way that brings glory to God. Now, the problem is that in times of great moral testing, people are tempted to choose and act based on short term earthly benefits. And when people do this, they risk forfeiting the eternal rewards and blessings that God has promised to us. And that's why it's so critical for us to consider the encouragement of a book like Hebrews. And remember, the author himself described the book of Hebrews as a book of exhortation. It's a book of encouragement. And so here we, we need to remind ourselves and encourage ourselves that believers in every age have faced similar tests and that God has a purpose in every test and trial that we face. And so in the midst of our crises, we must also exercise faith in order to choose and to act rightly. And that's what we'll be trying to draw out as we look at these examples. Now, there are seven examples. Uh, you notice the phrase, verse 23, by faith. And we've already been introduced to this in the earlier verses in this chapter. Uh, in our text tonight, seven times we see this phrase repeated, by faith, by faith, by faith. And in these seven examples, we see uh, uh, the, the people that in their own time, during this uh, period of crisis and difficulty, people that chose and acted rightly by faith. And so the point in these examples is that we need to emulate their faith. We need to imitate their faith. So let's consider these examples. Notice, first of all, that we must emulate the faith of Moses' parents in Egypt. Verse 23, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. 
Now notice here that uh, this is a passive verb. He was hidden. The subject is Moses. Moses was hidden. Obviously, if we convert this to a, uh, an active uh, uh, verb, uh, what we would see is that Moses' parents hid Moses for three months. Now, the reason Moses is placed face, uh, first in this sentence is because we see all of these examples are related to uh, the time of the Exodus, the time around which Moses lived and acted. But notice here the faith of Moses' parents. Moses was hidden by faith. Uh, consider, first of all, the circumstances in which they acted. Uh, it says here that when he was born. Now, this is a circumstantial clause. It's describing the circumstances in which his parents made their choice and uh, in which they acted. So what was the time in which they exercised their faith? Well, it was the time when Moses was born. We need to notice, first of all, that this was a time of great oppression by the Egyptians and by the king of Egypt. Exodus records that the Egyptians had enslaved the children of Israel after the death of Joseph, uh, who had done so much good for the nation in uh, preserving the lives uh, of the people of uh, Egypt as well as the lives of the children of Israel, that after his death, a pharaoh rose up that did not know Joseph. And this pharaoh issued a command that all of the male children of the Jews must be thrown into the river. And so this placed the children of Israel in a great crisis. They'd been enslaved. They had no civil rights. They uh, uh, were under the mercy or the lack of mercy of their masters, the Egyptians. And now the Egyptian king had issued a command that the male children were all to be murdered, be put to death. Many Jews during this period had surrendered their faith in God and in God's promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And again, we need to notice that it is the word of God, the promise of God, that is the foundation for faith. Many of these Jews had surrendered this faith. They had given up their hope and expectation based on God's promise to Abraham. And in their bitter bondage, many of them simply tried to survive from day to day. So we notice, first of all, that this was a time of great oppression by the Egyptians and the king of Egypt. But then we also understand, it says right on the face of it here, that this was the time of Moses' birth. It says when he was born. Uh, Exodus 6.20 tells us the parents of Moses and, uh, and uh, uh, the parents of Moses were Amram and Jochebed. Uh, before the birth of Moses, they had two other children. Aaron was the firstborn. Miriam was a daughter, and it was evident that before the birth of Moses, the king had issued this edict that the male children must be thrown into the Nile. And this fact presented the parents of Moses with a moral dilemma. They must either obey the king by killing their baby or disobey the king, even though they were slaves, to disobey the king and risk the consequences of punishment, perhaps even death. So here we see these were the circumstances in which they exercised their faith. Notice also the demonstration of their faith. Uh, it says here that he was hidden for three months. Now the basis upon which they acted was by faith. Again, seven times in these verses, Faith is described as the basis upon which these individuals made moral choices and made uh, decisions upon which they acted. And the key element in all of these decisions and actions was their faith in God. Uh, just remember, look back up to verse 6. Uh, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, that is, to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So the demonstration of the faith of Amram and Jochebed was that they chose to disobey the king and to preserve the life of their infant child. Now, this would not have been an easy thing to do. Uh, the Jewish people were uh, pressed together, probably in 
uh, lower class housing that were tightly packed together with lots of people in close proximity. And many of these Jews that were more than ready to report to the authorities if they uh, found someone was disobeying the king's edict. And so we understand that children, uh, newborn children in particular, cry a lot. They cry during the day. They cry during the night. And so Moses' parents made the choice, in spite of all of these difficulties, uh, in the face of the king's commandment, they chose to preserve Moses alive. Finally, we see the explanation for their faith. And there are two phrases here that describe uh, some of the reasons, the human, from a human perspective, what were the reasons for which they exercised faith by preserving his life? And first of all, it says, because they saw he was a beautiful child. Now, this word beautiful in the original language is an interesting term. It only occurs two times in the New Testament. Both times, it's used with reference to baby Moses. We just read in Acts chapter 7. Uh, And just to remind you what it said there about Moses when he was born, it says that uh, he was a a beautiful child to God. That's how Stephen described it. He used the same word. And in fact, this word is actually found in the Greek translation of the Old Testament in uh, in the passage in Exodus. So uh, both Stephen and the author of Hebrews have taken this term out of the Greek translation of the New Testament and they have uh, uh, showed that the reason that Moses' parents were willing to brave disobeying the king's commandment by exercising their faith in God, first of all, is because they saw that he was a beautiful child. Now, uh, Stephen said he was a beautiful child to God. And in that statement, we see that there was something visible in the countenance of this infant child that indicated he was specially chosen and marked out by God for a special purpose. Uh, And so here we see that it was the appearance of the child that motivated the parents to disobey the king's command. Uh, The parents recognized Uh, because they had a faith that was nourished by God's care and faithfulness to his people, uh, because they believed in God's plan for his people and his promises to Abraham, they were motivated to preserve Moses alive. We see a second statement here, a second reason for their faith. It says uh, they were not afraid of the king's command. The king's edict required them to disobey God's moral law. Now, the Ten Commandments came after this event. Obviously, uh, Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. They came to Mount Sinai. It was at Mount Sinai that God gave the Ten Commandments. But these moral laws were not newly invented at Mount Sinai. In fact, these were God's moral requirements for people from the beginning of the creation. Uh, We only need to think about Cain, who murdered his brother Abel. And we understand that this was acknowledged as uh, as a violation of God's law and God's will. And so here, the the parents of uh, Moses, Amram and Jacob, uh, uh, in order for them to obey the king's command, they would have had to violate God's moral law. This put them in this moral dilemma. Should they obey God or should they obey man? Uh, In Acts 5.29, you remember how the apostles responded to this problem. They told the uh, leaders of the Jewish Sanhedrin that we ought to obey God rather than men. And so it was because the parents of Moses did not fear the king's commandment that they were willing by faith to preserve him alive. Now, here we notice an important fact about faith. Faith acknowledges God's ultimate authority in our life and enables us to overcome the fear of man. Uh, Proverbs tells us the fear of man brings a snare. And in fact, the fear of man is one of the uh, primary temptations that causes people to 
uh, fall in sin and to disobey God's commands. But here we see that faith equips us to withstand pressure to commit sin, to violate God's moral law. Today, we see that people face pressure from people uh, in many ways. Oftentimes, they're even facing pressure from their, uh, uh, from their uh, authority figures, the people that are over them in society or in business. Uh, sometimes people face pressure from their parents or from their boss or from their customers or from their friends or even from the government to commit sin by violating God's clear moral commandments. Uh, This might involve pressure to participate in idol worship or ancestor worship. It may be pressure to lie or to deceive others. It may be pressure to participate in immoral activities. But in fact, we need to recognize if we exercise faith, it will equip us to overcome the fear of man. In verses 24 through 26, we see the second example. We must emulate the faith of Moses in Egypt. Notice the circumstances in which Moses chose and acted by faith. Uh, Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So here again, we have a circumstantial clause. It was when he became of age. It was the time of Moses' maturity when he made this choice and made this decision. Uh, We need to stop and think for a moment. Moses grew up as a member of Pharaoh's household. As a member of Pharaoh's household, he would have received the best education of his day. He lived in luxury in the king's palace. But Moses never forgot that he was a Jew and a member of God's chosen people. He never forgot the promises that God had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so here we see at the time Moses was 40 years of age, that by this time Moses had achieved the pinnacle of earthly success. He was in line for the throne of Egypt. But it was at this point in his life, at a time of uh, physical and social maturity, that Moses made the decision to reject his status as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, we recognize that Moses made this decision not rashly. He didn't make it during the immaturity of his youth. But he made this decision, this choice, with full consideration after he had arrived at the age of maturity. So the circumstances were, first of all, it was the time of his maturity, but also it was in the time of his greatness. Uh, The phrase, when he became of age, in the original language, it literally says, when he became great. In Greek, this actually is an ambiguous term. It's frequently used to describe becoming of full age to become an adult. But also this phrase is used to describe a person who becomes great in power, in authority, in influence, or in deeds. For instance, in Acts 7.22, it doesn't use this exact phrase, but here's how Stephen described Uh, Moses. He says, Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now, here, Moses, in this position in Pharaoh's palace, as a member of Pharaoh's family, we need to recognize Egypt at this time was the greatest nation on earth. Now, today, globally, uh, Thinking geopolitically, we see that there's a great struggle going on internationally about who is going to be the greatest superpower of our day. And um, uh, that is an issue that is yet to be resolved. But in the time of Moses, there was no debate about who the superpower really was. There was only one superpower in Moses' day. That was Egypt. Egypt. Uh, was at the epitome of culture and civilization. It was at the epitome of science and technology. Uh, 
Uh, it was at the peak of religion and spirituality. And as a nation, it was at, it was, uh, at the height of wealth and affluence globally. And we might also say that Egypt was in a position of global, military, and political power. And here we see Moses as a prince of Egypt in line for the throne that Moses had achieved the pinnacle of earthly success. He enjoyed privilege and power and position and prosperity. And it was at this time, after he had achieved all of this earthly success, that Moses made the decision to leave it all behind. So these are the circumstances in which Moses chose and acted by faith. Notice the demonstration of his faith. He refused to identify himself as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now, this was a shocking decision. Um, You know, if they had tabloids back then, this would have been on the front page of the National Enquirer. Uh, This was something that was a shocking bit of news. Uh, It would have been printed in all of the society columns of the newspaper. Because here was this man who was at the top of the heap in his society, who renounced it all and refused to identify himself as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, Exodus 2.11 tells us that when Moses was 40 years old, he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens. Now, that's a very brief description. But in fact, in this brief statement, we see Moses acting on his choice. He went out to view the Uh, the Jewish people in the midst of their slavery, in their hard bondage, and he was willing to identify himself with them rather than to identify as a prince of Egypt. Now, this was a moral choice that Moses made on the basis of faith. And again, we come to this question. We asked this last time as we uh, thought about Abraham's faith. How do we view our identity? How do we think about our identity as a human being, as a person? We talked about Abraham. Remember, we said that Abraham viewed himself as a sojourner, a pilgrim, that he did not view Canaan as his homeland, but he was looking for a heavenly city, that he viewed himself as a citizen of heaven. Well, here we see Moses, who made the decision to identify himself not as a prince of Egypt, but as a Jewish slave to suffer with his own people. Now, when he went out to uh, view his brothers, his brethren, and to see their burdens, uh, remember we see we, we are told that he saw an Egyptian beating a Jewish slave, and Moses killed him. Now, we may think of this as an act of passion. Uh, Moses saw this and it made him so angry that he lost his temper and murdered this guy. But in fact, this is not what was taking place. Moses had already chosen to identify with God's people. And in this action, he was making an irrevocable choice to identify with his people and not with the Egyptians. Moses viewed himself not as an Egyptian, but as a member of the people of God. And that is also our primary identification. We are not primarily citizens of Taiwan or citizens of America or citizens of some other nation. We are, in fact, citizens of heaven and we are a part of the people of God. Verse 25 provides the explanation for his faith. It says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And we see, first of all, that uh, he made a moral choice. Uh, He made the choice to identify himself as a member of the mistreated people of God. Uh, From a human perspective, uh, many people would see this as an irrational choice, as an irresponsible choice, as an unbelievable choice. 
How could anyone make the choice to give up all this wealth and position and reputation and power in order to identify with an enslaved and suffering race that had no rights and no possessions? And the reason was it was done on the basis of his faith in the future uh, in the future of his people as heirs to God's promise to Abraham. And it was because Moses believed that there was a future inheritance for his people, that he was willing to renounce his identity as an Egyptian prince. We see also that he made the moral choice to reject the temporary pleasures of sin, uh, The point here is that these passing pleasures or these temporary pleasures involve the enjoyment of all of the earthly advantages of his privileged position. Uh, But it calls them here the enjoyment, uh, temporary enjoyment of sin. Why is it called sin? Well, I think there are two reasons that we can understand. First of all, they involve worldly and sensual pleasures that violated God's moral laws. But they also uh, represented uh, the enjoyment of his privileged status, which involved a rejection of his identity as a member of God's people. Moses refused to reject his birthright, birthright as a member of God's chosen people. So we see, first of all, that he made a moral choice, uh, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. But we see also that he made a moral evaluation in verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Notice, first of all, that Moses placed high value on the reproach of Christ. Well, what is the reproach of Christ? Well, first of all, we understand that uh, in some sense, Moses was able to look ahead by faith and Uh, recognize the future sufferings of Israel's Messiah. And in identifying with God's suffering people, he was also identifying with God's suffering Messiah. And so the sufferings of Christ here, the reproach of Christ, are those future sufferings that Christ would experience when he went to the cross to uh, pay the penalty for our sins. But also the reproach of Christ involves the suffering and reproach that God's people experienced for Christ's sake. That as followers and people of God, we too will experience suffering along with Christ. Now Moses valued the reproach of Christ as something of greater value than the treasures of Egypt. All the wealth of Egypt in comparison to the suffering of Christ had no value. Romans 8.17 says it this way. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now here we notice that suffering and glory are inseparable. That in order to experience the glory with Christ in the future, we must experience the suffering with Christ in the present. And so for Moses, the moral choice was between enjoying temporary pleasures of sin and forfeiting those eternal and permanent inheritance that God had promised to his people. And the reason he was willing to do so was because he looked to the reward. And the reward is that future return that we will receive in proportion to our faithfulness to Christ in the present day. So faith has the the effect of enabling us to embrace a proper value system. Now materialism views earthly treasure as that which possesses the greatest value. The materialist views the only things that are real, the only things that are true, the only things that are to be considered are things we can see, things we can touch. And yet these things are all temporary. 
for the Christian, faith has the effect of recalibrating our values so that we are able to choose and act according to the ultimate value of invisible, eternal, and heavenly things. Matthew 6, 19 through 21 says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 27, we see the third example. We must emulate the faith of Moses in Midian. Verse 27 says, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Notice the demonstration of his faith was that he left Egypt and was willing to spend 40 years in the land of Midian. Moses left Egypt with all of its wealth, its comfort, and its fame. He went into the desert in the land of Midian. And this emphasizes that Moses' choice was one that he persevered in. He endured the hardships of living a nomadic lifestyle in the desert and made no return to return to his old life in Egypt. Just as Abraham left Ur of the Chaldeans, And did not look back. Moses left Egypt and did not look back. His faith enabled him to endure adversity. Notice the explanation for his faith. It says that he did not fear the wrath of the king. Uh, On the face of it, this seems to contradict what Exodus says. says that Moses feared and Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh Uh, Exodus 2, verses 14 and 15. But this is not really a contradiction. We need to remember Moses had already rejected his identity as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. And Moses fleeing from Pharaoh and fleeing from Egypt was simply the outworking of his choice to identify with the suffering people of God. And because of his choice, he was persecuted by Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who sought his life. Part of that suffering was this persecution. Moses feared God more than he feared Pharaoh. And again, we see a second time how faith equips people to overcome the fear of man. It goes on to say, we see a second explanation for his faith. It says, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Faith, in fact, is seeing the invisible. Faith is a type of spiritual eyesight. Faith is the means by which we are able to uh, uh, see and recognize and know that which is not physically present to our physical sight. Moses trusted what he saw and knew about God, even though he could not see God. He reckoned God to be greater than the power and might of Pharaoh with all of his armies. And it was this spiritual vision of the invisible God that equipped Moses to endure in the land of Midian for 40 years as a lowly shepherd. Think about that change of status from a prince of Egypt to a shepherd of sheep. So here we see the faith of Moses enabled him to endure. Verse 28, we must emulate the faith of Moses at the Passover. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Here we see the demonstration of Moses' faith was that he kept the Passover. Uh, What this is talking about is the fact that, uh, remember, Moses in this contest with Pharaoh had already seen God bring down nine plagues on the Egyptian people. These were horrible plagues, and yet God 
uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart so that he was not willing to uh, release the children of Israel and allow them to leave his land. And so God told Moses that he was going to bring one final plague, that he was going to uh, strike the firstborn of all the people and all the animals in the land of Egypt. And so God commanded Moses that he needed to prepare a Passover feast. God gave him specific instructions. Every household or uh, uh, households together were to prepare a lamb, that they were to keep this lamb for 10 days. After 10 days, they were to kill this lamb, put the blood on the door of their house. They were to close the doors and eat the Passover meal according to the regulations given by God. And Moses' faith was demonstrated in the fact that he not only kept it for himself, but he instructed the children of Israel and established this as a feast for the entire nation. Just as Noah believed God's warning of the judgment of the flood and built an ark, so Moses believed God's warning of the judgment on the firstborn in Egypt And so he established and kept the Passover feast. His faith in God's word caused him to obey and to instruct Israel to obey God's commands for this Passover feast. We see also it says that he kept the sprinkling of blood. Now this was the critical element of the entire Passover celebration. The killing of the lamb by the head of every Jewish home, the sprinkling of its blood on the doorposts, Uh, and lintel of the house was a picture in advance of the sprinkling of Christ's blood for the remission of sins. Uh, Just turn over to chapter 12. We see this mentioned here in verse 24. Chapter 12 and verse 24, speaking of our uh, uh, future gathering to, uh, to God, uh, we're gathered to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And that's the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. So Moses, by keeping this sprinkling of the blood of the Passover lamb, provided a picture in advance, uh, a type of the shed blood of Christ for our salvation. And then finally, we see the result of his faith. It says lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. So it was a result of Moses' faith and the children of Israel in obedience uh, to God's commandment, the, the destroying angel, as it passed through the land of Egypt, it passed over the houses of the Jews where the blood was applied. So here we see the result of Moses' faith was actually twofold. Because of Moses' faith, on the one hand, the firstborn of the children of Israel were saved. But on the other hand, we see the firstborn of the children of the Egyptians were killed. We see here this pairing of faith resulting on the one hand in salvation for God's people and in judgment for those who are unbelievers. This brings us to verse 29. Here we move beyond Moses to the faith of the children of Israel uh, as a nation at the Red Sea. You must emulate the faith of Israel at the Red Sea. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. So the demonstration of their faith was that they passed through the sea on dry ground. Remember that at the Red Sea, Israel was closely followed by the powerful Egyptian army. And so as they came to the Red Sea, they were hemmed in on four sides. Behind them was the Egyptian army. On the sides, the mountains cut them off from escape. In front of them, the sea blocked any progress that they could make. The passage in Exodus tells us that they were afraid. They cried out. But at God's command, the people set aside their fear. They went forward into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and they were saved. And here we see also the result of their faith. 
was that the Egyptians were overthrown in their presumptuous unbelief. And here again, we see this pairing of salvation for God's people and judgment for unbelievers. That the Egyptians who did not have faith and their action in entering into the uh, into the, uh, the the waters of the Red Sea in pursuit of the, the children of Israel was an act of presumption. And so in their rage against God, in their rage against God's people, they uh, uh, presumptuously pursued them into the Red Sea. And the result was that the entire army of Pharaoh was drowned. We can see this pairing of salvation and judgment as we think about God's promise to us that will occur at the second coming of Christ. When Christ returns, believers will experience final salvation, but unbelievers will experience judgment. Now, we have been saved. Our sins are forgiven. We have been rescued from the penalty of our sins. But our salvation is not yet complete. We are still waiting for the consummation of faith in our full salvation, which will not take place until Christ returns. And when Christ returns, we see that he will not only bring salvation for the people of God, but he will bring judgment for the unbelieving world. Verse 30, you must emulate the faith of Israel at Jericho. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. And here the result of the faith of the children of Israel was that the walls of Jericho fell down. So when Israel crossed the Jordan and entered Canaan, the first city that they encountered was Jericho. Jericho was a strongly fortified city with uh, high walls. uh, They could not be easily defeated. by normal combat. But in a miraculous display of God's power, the book of Joshua describes how the walls of Jericho fell down flat, enabling the Jews under the leadership of Joshua to enter the city and to destroy and defeat its inhabitants. So the result of their faith was that the walls of Jericho fell down. That was a great miraculous event. They believed God's word. So here's the demonstration of their faith that they encircled the city for seven days in obedience to the Lord's command. Uh, uh, Their faith was demonstrated by their obedience. Um, Walking around a city has nothing in and of itself that will enable uh, people to defeat this city. Yet because of God's promise, God's people uh, in faith in God's word and God's promise, they obey God's command. Uh, They walked around the city for seven days. And on the seventh day, when they shouted and blew the trumpets, God brought the walls down. Their faith was the human explanation for God's display of miraculous power. And finally, you must emulate the faith of Rahab. Verse 31. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So here it describes, first of all, the result of her faith was that she did not perish with the unbelievers. It's it's surprising that Rahab is mentioned at all in this list of heroes of faith. First of all, she was a woman. Second of all, she was a Gentile. She was a Canaanite. Thirdly, she was a sinner. We're told here and in the book of uh, Joshua that she was a harlot. And yet Rahab's faith saved her from destruction with the rest of the citizens of this city. Furthermore, she rescued her entire family along with herself. Uh, The book of Joshua describes later how Rahab married a Jewish man and as a result became an ancestor of both King David and of Messiah Jesus. In the human ancestry of these men, we see Rahab 
is listed. Notice the demonstration of her faith was that she received the spies peaceably. Her act of faith was demonstrated by receiving these Jewish spies that came in to spy out the city. With peace here is describing the fact that she received them and entertained them hospitably. She hid them, helped them to escape from those who sought their lives. And the book of Exodus describes in her speech to the spies the content of her faith. She believed that the God of Israel had dried up the water of the Red Sea, had defeated the powerful kings uh, on the east of the Jordan, Sihon and Og. She believed that he was the true God who would deliver Jericho into the hands of Israel. And it was this faith that caused her to receive the spies peaceably. And so, as a result, she did not perish with the unbelievers. And we see the entire city of Jericho, apart from her and her family, were destroyed. So in all of these examples, we notice that faith is the ability to choose and act correctly in the midst of the crisis. All of us today will face a crisis. All of us, like these Old Testament figures, will be required to exercise our faith in order to experience glory with Christ, reward with Christ, uh, uh, inheritance with Christ in the future. And we need to emulate their faith in the moral choices that we make in our lives on a daily basis and in the activities, the actions that flow out of having an adjusted value system that looks for the future reward and reckons its value as greater than the temporary rewards of earthly pleasures. Let's pray as we close. Father, we recognize that in our own day, uh, we will continually be faced with these choices and decisions that we need to make. We ask for your grace. We ask for the uh, uh, blessing and power of your spirit in our lives, that we would uh, demonstrate faith, that we would exercise faith by making moral choices and by uh, making uh, uh, actions that reflect uh, a true value system. We pray you'd help us by faith to see the invisible God, to look to the invisible inheritance that you have for us in the future, and that we would account these things of greater value than all things we see around us on this earth, even of more value than our own lives. We pray that you would help us to be faithful to Christ now, that we might enjoy glory with Christ hereafter. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.